So thank you once again to all of our participants um, and our panel panel members. Um, I wanted to first and foremost thank also a number of people who worked so hard behind the scenes. Um, Pamela Davis, um, who helped set up also our extraordinary uh, intern, uh, summer intern, who is a, I believe it's a junior or a sophomore at uh, UVA uh, with ICAP Garvey. Uh, working with you on the, on, the, on the poll was great along with you and Tafari and Jiho. So thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to um, give you all first uh, the kind of lay of the land for today. Um, I will introduce uh, and share a little bit about each of the panel members. Um, then we will jump straight into a poll. Uh, we've developed a poll um, really looking at a variety of different questions on both the macro um, economy, but also specific questions that relate to global supply chains, as well as diversity inclusion. Um, and so we will do that poll. We'll then have about 30 minutes of, of Q&A. Uh, I'll start with um, asking a few of the initial questions, and then I, I, can't, I can't wait to open it up to the great questions for all of you. Uh, we'll, at the end of our session, we will retake the poll to see how many of you changed your positions on the polling questions. Um, so I think that'll be an interesting kind of uh, discussion and, and way for us to kind of explore these, these issues a bit more deeper. Um, so first I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Don Wang. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Don as well as his wife, Fiona, uh, for a few years. Um, Don is currently the general manager at uh, Varsal, which is a kind of petrochemical uh, um, company um, and one of the interesting things about Don is, and in addition, it's also a specialty chemicals company as well. Um, he received his BBA in finance and economics from Emory University, and then he subsequently really received his, his MBA from SEEBS, the China European International Business School. Um, he is also a member of the National Committee of U.S.-China relations, um, and we are also board members together at uh, the global uh, GIFP, the Global Institute of Financial Professionals, um, and we are thankful to be able to, to kind of also have another member, uh, Celia, and to be able to do these joint events together. GIFP is an extraordinary organization that really serves as a, uh, an important link with a number of other, um, you know, China, a number of other countries, particularly on the professional certificate um, dimensions. And so I'll, I'll place a link in, in, the, in the chat for all of you. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Ms. Celia uh, Capsamera. Um, she is a distinguished lecturer at Columbia University School of Professional Studies. Um, previously, she's also held positions as a consultant at IFG companies, and she also was previously the head of risk management at AXA Liabilities Managers. Uh, as many of you know, AXA is one of the largest French insurance companies. Um, I had the opportunity went at HSBC to work actually closely with them, as well as with a number of other insurance companies. Um, educated at Wharton Business School. Um, and what you may not know about Celia is that she is also a Fulbright Scholar as well. So we are very delighted to have you and welcome, Celia. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Elmer He. Uh, Elmer is currently the Chief uh, Investment Officer at the Murdoch Charitable Trust. Uh, the Murdoch Charitable Trust was established in 1975 to enrich the quality of life in Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. And one of its core missions is to serve individuals, families, and communities across the Pacific Northwest. Um, Elmer has also held positions, uh, senior leadership roles at Ernst & Young. Uh, he also previously worked at Morgan Stanley. Um, he has a bachelor's in science in mechanical engineering from Columbia University. He also has a master's in industrial engineering and operational research also from Columbia University and also did his MBA at Columbia University. And what you may not know about Elmer is that I have known him for over 30 years. And um, he's someone who I have the highest respect for both him and his family. Um, and he is also a spiritual advisor for the My Mask movement. That was new to me. And so the My Mask movement is a social enterprise with a 5013C that, that provides custom fit masks to under underserved and marginalized populations. Last, but definitely not least, I would like to introduce my dear friend, William um, Adeji, um, who is currently uh, you know, managing director and the Alliance director for CBRE. Um, William has a plethora of experience um, as, a, as a senior executive, 
Um, he also has has an MBA. Um, and what is interesting about William that you 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 may all not know is that he was an NCAA nominee. And I just learned what that means. So he ran track and field uh, at at college, and 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 you know was was nominated to to be uh, you know uh, you know in the NCAA. Um, and so we are extraordinarily grateful and thankful to have such a distinguished panel. So with that, um, we will go ahead and start with um, um, the poll. Uh, and um, panelists, you are welcome to take the poll as well. So I'm going to to go ahead and launch. Uh, you'll have set exactly seven minutes to complete the poll. Um, so you'll see a timer right now. So please complete the poll and then I will review the results with all of the panelists. All right, for, for all the viewers who may just have recently joined, you've got 10 seconds, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, get them in, five, four, three, two, one. All right, I am ending the poll and I'm sharing the results. So for the first question, do you or your organization plan on going back to the office in the fall? All right, about 40% said yes, 8% said no, 36% said maybe, 16% said depending on the capacity of the office, okay? Um, seemed about in line with what I thought the results might be. Um, question number two, how are you thinking about donating and philanthropic giving now when compared to before the pandemic? Of our participants, 56% said, I will try to make it a priority. 32% said, I hadn't thought about it. 12% said, I am not concerned by it at all, okay? Question number three, what concerns you most about the state of the U.S. economy? 36% of our respondents said inflation, 20% said unemployment, 24% said an increase in COVID variants causing a surge of cases, and last, 20% said the availability of affordable housing as one of the key concerns, okay? Interesting. All right. So clearly inflation, the big, the big concern. Question number four, how should people and companies think about supply chains after the pandemic? 12% said, I haven't really thought about it. 60% said bottlenecks in supply chains causing an increase in prices. So in kind of in line with what we saw previously with inflation. 28% of our respondents said volatility for the supply of certain goods may increase. Okay. All right. So we've got those top answers. Question number five, how are consumers like yourself dealing with inflation? 28% said they're cutting back on expenses, maybe having less Starbucks, et cetera. 56% said no major lifestyle changes. Interesting, wow. 8% said rely more on government assistance and 8% said never thought about it, okay? Question number six, how should companies and individuals think about risk management from an insurance standpoint? Celia, this has your name written all over it. 48% said educate themselves on the key risks today and can be mitigated by insurance. 48%, interesting, okay. 28% said promoting a healthier style of living, okay? 12% said heightened awareness of climate change and its impact. And last, 12% said not sure. And our final question of the poll, how can we build a more equitable and inclusive environment for managing risk across sectors? Number one, 24% of our attendees said fostering allyship between people of all backgrounds. 12% said addressing systemic racism, discrimination, and racism. 52% said increasing access of communities of color to capital, financial literacy, and mentorship. And 12% said other. 
Okay. All right. We've got a lot of um, food food for thought there with with our polls. So let me just go ahead and um, start with with the first question. Uh, I'll open. I'll start with a few prompting questions. Um, Don, I want to start with you, just with with global supply chains and kind of you know. Um, I, th I think clearly one of the quintessential questions that people have thought about kind of both pre, during, and, and uh, you know, thinking from a post pandemic is what are, the, what are the quintessential lessons learned from the pandemic with respect to global supply chains? You know, people have talked about maybe onshoring, you know, critical PPE like masks, et cetera. How do you think, what do you think are the quintessential lessons learned? Uh, great. Thank you, Errol. Uh, so I'll just start with three quick points, and then maybe we can elaborate from there. Uh, the first one, I think, is decreasing the emphasis on just-in-time inventory. Uh, the White House recently published a report stating that economy-wide and retail inventory levels hit a record low in March. Uh, as companies are struggling with restoring supply chains that were largely idle during the pandemic and is quickly gearing up as the economy reopens. Uh, as you can see, just in time works when things are running perfectly, but now uh, given all the shocks we've seen, including the pandemic, trade war, cyber attacks, et cetera, uh, there's shortages in a lot of very key materials such as semiconductors, um, basic goods, things like that. Uh, so we can see it's worth it for companies to run their working capital a little more expensively to ensure their customers don't have disruption of supply. Uh, the second point is, I think it's in important to emphasize quality over price when choosing partners in the supply chain. Uh, although a cheap input is good for the short term, quality partners will more than make up for the added costs and the reliability and the better output and yields that the inputs will be used for. Also, by sharing some of the profits in the value chain, it helps to ensure the financial position of the supplier as if the supplier is squeezed too hard and needs to leave the market, it will cause multiplied negative effects in the supply chain. And the last point is, I think it's important in this very volatile time to have multiple points of contact that ensures that if any individual issue with a vendor or region in the supply chain will not bring down the entire supply chain of the company. But it's important to note also though, that this must be balanced with the previous point as diversity of supply chain needs to be balanced with giving supply chain stakeholders enough visibility and predictability for them to plan for the future effectively. Great, thanks so much, Don. Uh, Elmer, I'd love to move to you. Um, obviously, you you work at the, the Murdoch Charitable Trust. How how is how are organizations thinking about charitable giving in both a, a, a pre po and and kind of post pandemic environment? Um, should we be giving, I, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, Elmer, organizations like the Murdoch Charitable Trust actually possibly more increased more of their giving um, to a number of different communities. Um, I know a number of philanthropic organizations really stepped up during the pandemic. How should organizations be thinking about charitable giving in this period of time? On your mute, Elmer. Story of my life. Thanks, Earl. Um, it's a great question. I think there's two parts to this. One is, um, a, as you know, most endowments and foundations have a requirement because of their purpose to give, do philanthropic uh, granting and, and, and donations and so forth. And we, you know, for the Murdoch Trust, we, we tend to be somewhere in the five to six percent range, which is very typical for our peer groups. But last year, when when the pandemic started, we accelerated some, some things and put in an additional uh, amount of money for, for COVID response to our existing grant grantees and nonprofit partners. Um, we still have that program in place going forward, at least for another year or two. And we're, uh, I would say, always looking at the strategy of what, what this does in terms of a long-term impact. Uh, you know, we I won't go into how other folks do their grant making process. I will just say that from the Murdoch Trust standpoint, we, we've had a very refined process that continues to get uh, recalibrated and, and, and thought through and discussed internally every year at a strategic offsite. Um, 
you know, from a giving standpoint, though, I mean, I think people part A is one. Uh, I think there is, has been a step up by most peers. I think there has been an increase by a lot of people, whether it's an individual high net worth family or foundation or endowment. Uh, but part B is also don't lose perspective of your mission and your long term horizon. Uh, most endowments, most uh, foundations should be thinking from at least how they manage their portfolio of assets as well to their grants, but they should be thinking about the long term horizon and then matching that up. There is some some overlap from, you know, what you call the traditional pension world and finance and capital markets of uh, asset liability matching. And, and I don't want to call it a liability, but, you know, when you think about what your, your long-term mission is, and ours is, is really to, you know, help them uh, get communities in the Pacific Northwest grow and thrive in a capacity basis. You know, we're, we've got horizon periods of 10 to 15 years. And so our investment approach should be the same to match with that of our grant grant making approach. And so you have to, part B is that keeping that long-term perspective in place and then marrying the two. And so I would imagine that most people are going to be thinking about the fact that they're being led to give an extra go beyond what they do on a normal run rate. But how do you, how do you balance that out with your, your own individual or you know family office or foundation mission of making sure that you retain the, the run rate capacity to um, to do your year your, your annual year in and year out giving. Thank you, Palmer. That was that was really profound. Appreciate that. Celia, I want to come to you next. Um, obviously, COVID has just, I mean, clearly impacted so many communities and has brought to mind so many fundamental questions that people haven't really thought about, such as insurance. Um, you know, what, what's the appropriate insurance that, that I should be having to protect my family, you know, the, my loved ones. Uh, it also fun brings into fundamental questions like climate change and how companies and organizations should be uh, responding to um, Hurricane Claudette, for example, that has just ravaged um, states like uh, Mississippi, Alabama, et cetera. What, what are some of the, the lessons learned from kind of the pandemic with respect to insurance companies and insurers in particular? Thank you for the question, Earl. Uh, glad to be here. Regarding uh, climate change, um, what we can say is that um, it is very true that uh, not only uh, insurers, but also customers, regulators, uh, shareholders are all eager to see the insurers uh, provide more products and services uh, in response to the greening of the, uh, the global economy. Uh, so what is happening is the insurers realizing that they should uh, attack the issue from the enterprise risk management um, approach. And that would mean uh, an approach that would cut through the domains of underwriting, asset management and governance. And uh, by doing that, they uh, increase their multidisciplinary approach, which becomes increasingly uh, sophisticated. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the initial response, uh, particularly in the United States, it has been uh, the focus on financial means uh, to, to do that. So they wanted to limit basically their exposure to losses. Uh, of course, you know, people want to be insured, but uh, insurers have to be uh, choosy as to who they would insure. Uh, and uh, they limit availability by tightening basically terms and conditions as well as raising prices. Um, now, managing the risks from a climate change um, uh, perspective requires, you know, a action that is both to mitigate the atmospheric greenhouse uh, gas levels uh, through reducing the global emissions, uh, but also to adapt the, to the changes in climate at the local level so that they can minimize risks and maximize potential opportunities. And there are things that uh, insurers are uh, trying to do and uh, they are the right things to do. And there are a few things that I have in mind uh, I don't know if we want to talk about them now or, or later, uh, but basically uh, 
if you want to address that in terms of what the insurers should do, um, here are some things that uh, I think and you know, people in the industry are, are thinking they should be doing. Uh, one thing is to promote risk awareness and risk reducing behavior. And uh, how do you do that? Through risk-based pricing, basically. Uh, another thing would be to develop reinsurance products and um, or terms and conditions that incentivize risk reduction. The third thing would be to finance this risk reduction and adaptation uh, measures. And that would be basically something that large insurers can do. And there are a few things that I can mention later uh, in the interest of time as to how they could do it. Uh, in terms of uh, other things they could do, uh, they can offer, uh, together with uh, you know, the, the products, also risk management and advisory services to their clients. And uh, finally, they can engage in direct consumer, both, uh, I mean, uh, homeowner and uh, business education activities on climate change adaptation. And finally, uh, foster some uh, disaster resilience practices and technologies. So these are things that the insurers could, could do. And I'll stop at that uh, in case, you know, we need to uh, elaborate later. Thank you so much, Celia, and that was very comprehensive. Um, William, I wanna to come to you. you. You do great work both uh, in, in, in a variety of different capacities, but one of the areas that you focus on is in your responsibility is diversity and inclusion. Um, and you serve as one of the, 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 the Global Alliance director. Um, help us understand when we think about diversity and inclusion and racial equity, you know, given what has transpired in the United States this year with, with um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, when we think about equity uh, and we think about allyship, um, what do you think are the quintessential issues that are, are you know, front of your mind with respect to the work that you do in diversity and inclusion? Well, thank you, Earl, and uh, glad to also join uh, the panelists to just talk about a variety of issues here, um, including, you know, the diversity and inclusion space. Uh, no question, you know, over the last year, given what we've all been through, um, and, and really not just the U.S. phenomena, but globally, I think this really exacerbated and extended globally in many ways. Um, I would say that, number one, there's a huge and heightened focus um, across all arenas, the public sphere, government, um, and more interestingly, even uh, across the, uh, the business world, both uh, you know, public and also private, on the topic of DE&I. And so I am seeing many companies that have interacted with counterparts at other companies focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, a lot more investment to bring leadership programming and kind of capacity in the space with the primary goal of reducing inequities and then providing um, avenues where underrepresented groups can have um, opportunities really to grow, to advance and to participate in some of the, the benefits and opportunities that um, historically they've been uh, marginalized from. And it's a multifaceted uh, problem. Uh, there's training and education that has to happen. Um, there are some equity related or structural things that have to be done within organizations to kind of unlock institutional barriers, if you will. Uh, but I think the bigger challenge um, is, is more than just the technical challenge of kind of solving, you know, putting a program in place or hiring people or having new policies or you know, whatever it might be, those are more technical challenges in a way that in some ways are, you know, e more easily solved than what is what I see an adaptive challenge of, um, of cultural change. Because with, with the cultural change piece, you're really dealing with hearts and minds and beliefs and values, and you can't legislate or fund uh, to have that change. Um, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, the heart and the beliefs and what motivate people. And until you can win that battle, um, a lot of what you might do ends up being uh, perfunctory and uh, may not have sustain sustainable impact uh, long-term. And maybe the last thing I'll say is uh, inequity has been with us since the human race has existed. So it's not 
anything new. Um, and during different eras of the world's history, different groups have been dominant and different groups have been underrepresented or marginalized. Uh, so in some way, it's a reality or phenomenon of, of being human. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, learn to do better and take advantage of opportunities and moments like we've had to strive for better, we should. Um, but we shouldn't be under the illusion that it's a unique and new phenomena. It's part of who we've been, and, and we hope that we can continue to grow. That was, thank you, William. That was that was beautifully articulated. Um, I'll I'll open up one um, question to the group, and and anyone can kind of take this on, and then I'll I'll open it up to the Q and A too, because we've already had several um, questions in the Q and A function, but. Um, James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley, um, made, made a kind of controversial statement recently where he was um, telling his employees that he expected them to be back in the office in, in the fall. And, um, you know, it was interesting. He, he, was, he was being interviewed by um, a, a, a person of the press and he said that, you know, if I do not see people back in the office, he said, we're going to have to have another type of conversation. And, um, you know, you know, essentially, he was sending a very strong message to his employees. Uh, I think one of the things he mentioned also is that if you can go to a restaurant in New York City, he said you can get you can essentially get you you can essentially get get yourself back into the office to work. Um, where where do you guys fall on that within your respective organizations? Um, in in addition to that, you know, I guess one one question that has been front and center that you know, I guess James Gordon is not answering is that, you know, for many of those who are maybe single parents who have to choose between, you know, essentially being at home or taking care of their child or going back to work, that's that's a different kind of issue and, and, and question they have to wrestle with. So I wanted to open it up to, to the group. Um, anyone can take this on. How are you analyzing and, and looking at returning to work in the fall? You know, Earl, I'm happy to maybe jump in quickly here just from a realty perspective, um, and, and I'll try to be uh, concise. So uh, really, uh, this is a, a big question in the minds of every company. Um, if, if I could add to the, the quote you just mentioned, uh, David Solomon from uh, Goldman Sachs said in February, working from home is an aberration that we're going to correct as quickly as possible. And then uh, James Fraser at Citi said most employees of their employees, they expect to be in the office, you know, three days a week when they emerge from the pandemic. And I think that um, those two statements span a spectrum of um, really two primary considerations. Um, and for every company, you know, the question is, are we uh, an office first type of company or are we a hybrid first type of company? Mm -hmm. And those two are important because it, it boils down to what type of work is being done and how best can that be done? Um, I would remind everyone that trends such as uh, you know de densification of of office space, where um, you know there was a trend for a while where um, office space was being reduced to be more efficient to get more workers per space. Well, that trend kind of cycles over time, like the economy. And at the beginning of uh, you know at the height of the last global financial crisis, we we're looking at roughly about 300 uh, plus square feet per employee, which reduced all the way to about 120 square feet per employee at the beginning of the pandemic. So more than half the space that was 10 years ago had already been reduced. You know, COVID came in and continued to accelerate and push that equation. However, ironically, because of social distancing and also the changing drivers for how office space will be used in the future, um, we see, and as we poll our clients, as we uh, talk to many companies, uh, more space per employee actually coming back into the picture. Um, but in the mix of that is you're thinking hybrid work, so not everybody's going to be in the office all of the time. So there, there's some complexities to work through there, and it hasn't changed how people come back to work now. In the next few months, is, I think about 80% of companies are going to be back online the fall or uh, what we are calling the future of work. So if you extrapolate this, you know, a few years down the line, work is going to be very different than it used to be. And it will be a mix of uh, remote. It will be a mix of office. It's not going to swing fully one way. And I don't think the answer is binary. So to that particular scenario where you're talking about the 
single parent um, family situation, um, it's not going to be a binary question of you either work all from the office or you work from home. I think employees have reasons why they want to be in the office. It's collaboration, it's right. training opportunities, it's networking, it's learning. Uh, the office is a very important strategy for many companies. It draws talent um, and it's going to be a part of it, but it's not going to be the same way it was before. And companies are very much open to being flexible and providing more optionality for for employees. So there's a lot more there, but those are just a few things that uh, uh, come to mind. So, so Earl, I'll just I'll just add to that. You know, I think from from most of our real estate managers uh, in our portfolio, they will tell you the same thing that William just said. You know, there's you know office as a segment of real estate is one of the most uncertain plays right now in its transition. You know, there's the obvious of industrials up, retail down kind of deal and <clears throat> multifamily and residential up as well. But office has been sort of in the middle with this uh, question mark of what does it look like? You know, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, they, they have many different articles on what is the future of work and, and, and you know, you can slice that title no matter how you want to do it. But you know, when we think about this context of this um, of this panel in terms of risk management and multidisciplinary approaches, I, I think you're going to find that most people are, as William just said, 80 percent are probably going to be heading back to work in some capacity full time in the fall. Um, you know, you have two extremes. You have a CEO of a major investment bank. Uh, making these statements. And I think there's, there's a, you know, not to defend or to attack. I think that there's a right for the CEO to say that to rally his troops, but you have to remember, and, and William said this at the very end of his comments is that um, banking is a very different animal than other corporations, you know, accounting and, and, and consulting is, is similar in this vein is that there's, there's a, it's a, it's a services organization. And each organization, particularly when you think about Goldman and Morgan and other investment banks, that sometimes they do all the same type of transactions. It's just a matter of the, the type of complexities that they, they get involved with, as well as um, the culture of the people. And, and so, you know, banking, cap, banking and capital markets, the big component of that is risk mitigation, which we're, we're trying to all approach to here. And, and part of that is having the right people with the right experience uh, doing these transactions on a consistent basis. And you can't do that if there's, if there's sporadic people in and out of the offices and culture, collaboration and coaching, the three C's, this is what I heard the other day is not taking place. And a lot of, a lot of folks, they don't question the productivity of employees right now. What they question is those three C's over the long run, as well as the long run implications for future productivity. Um, you can't differentiate yourself if you don't have a culture. And the most successful companies have had really unique cultures, cultures of success. And so I think he has the right to say that to a certain degree. But I also understand the plight of uh, uh, and the challenges of, of a single parent, which you know relates to one of the questions we took earlier in the, in the survey is basically, well, what do you think is one of the biggest things facing? Well, it could be unemployment. It could be inflation. I think the two are related, but when this, if, if the supply chain is messed up where people aren't working and uh, people aren't, you know, you know, not going back to certain jobs, then that single parent who can't find someone to help out is, is caught in that supply chain disruption at, the, at that part of the, of, the, of the equation. So there's no doubt that this is a multifaceted very intricate approach. And this is what you call the, the disruptive process that causes more risk into the, in, into the system. Great. Celia, did you want to jump in here? Yes. What I would like to add from my perspective in terms of uh, what's happening with academic institutions is that uh, they are all thinking along the lines of uh, how do we get our students back? Uh, and uh, as far as I know, uh, not only in my uh, institution at Columbia, but also at other uh, universities, uh, the idea is uh, let's go through the summer as we have been and uh, let's start fresh with uh, uh, online, uh, on campus rather, um, uh, uh, presence. 
in the fall. So a lot of us are expecting to uh, go back in the fall face-to-face uh, uh, -face with the students again. And uh, I know the students are looking forward to it. Uh, of course, one of the things that uh, is required uh, for more, uh, both students and uh, faculty is uh, to be vaccinated. So that is going to be basically one of the um, uh, requirements uh, for uh, going back to campus. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, this whole idea of uh, higher learning is evolving into more opportunities of uh, people uh, studying online. Uh, so there are a lot more uh, such uh, courses, a lot more such programs than they have been. And that was pre-pandemic, but uh, pandemic only accelerated uh, this trend. So uh, what institutions are doing are having their um, uh, physical uh, presence uh, uh, programs, but they also at the same time trying to develop um, next to them the uh, some more robust online uh, learning uh, programs. And uh, that's what's happening in most institutions, especially when it comes to the uh, graduate level. Uh, for the undergraduate, uh, it's a little different. Uh, it makes more, um, uh, it, it's more important for the students to be uh, in a environment where they are all together, where they live together, where they make uh, the new uh, friendships and uh, create re new relationships. So in this case, they tend to be uh, more concentrating on campus, but also this creates uh, more uh, complex issues for the uh, universities because they need to uh, arrange uh, for safe uh, on campus housing. Uh, so that has something to do with, uh, you know, the, uh, the plans of, uh, of the fall um, readmission to um, the new normal, so to speak. Yeah. Great point, Celia. And, and I think, you know, particularly for, for, inst for academic institutions, um, not only has COVID impacted how students come back to campus, but also the actual numbers for international students as well. I mean, that's been a huge issue, which a lot of institutions really rely on. Um, I, I saw a great article in the Financial Times of how academic institutions were so creative during the pandemic. One institution, I, I think it was in Europe, did a study abroad program all virtually in South Africa. So they arranged meetings with entrepreneurs from, from various South African countries, from um, sectors, and, and it was all done virtually. And so it was just a testament to how institutions, uh, particularly academic institutions, are reinventing themselves in this kind of COVID, you know, kind of an environment. Don, did you want to say anything on, on, on return to work before I open it up to Q&A for the audience? Uh, the other panelists have pretty much covered everything, but I just want to say for us, it's kind of dependent on the role. Uh, because we're shipping a physical good, uh, some of the roles by definition, you know, you have to be there. Uh, but for others like sales, um, you know, sales where they're on the road a lot, you know, they're doing Zoom calls with clients, so they don't actually have to be in the office. Uh, but it's good just to check in in person because there's a lot of communication uh, that's much better done in person. You can see with the articles on like Zoom fatigue and just things like that. There's certain things that can only be uh, replicated face to face. So I think the face to face aspect is irreplaceable, but we're blending in the remote work where possible. Great. Appreciate that. Um, so we've got several questions in the Q&A, so I'll just start with um, how I've received them. The first question is from Angana Shah, uh, based in Michigan. Angana, great to see you, and great, thank you so much for um, being here. Uh, Angana asked the question regarding supply chains. Did the pandemic cause companies to reconsider the geography of their suppliers? Closer or less global? if um, one of the panelists would like to take that. Yeah, I guess I'll take that since it's, um, you know, kind of my line of work. Uh, so the long and short answer of it is it depends. So um, for a lot of the components, the suppliers have kind of built up a very strong uh, position, kind of working with the customer, doing a very good cost advantage and really understanding the technical difficulties. So it's very hard to replace them on a short-term perspective. Uh, but long term, uh, probably there are people balance like the wait, waiting of the costing versus uh, 
reliability. Like for example, people in the U.S., um, you know, it's it's going to be more expensive to make a good here than a lot of other countries. Uh, so the people who are most likely to come back are the, the very mission critical, very highly complex products. Like for example, when you have a computer, um, just the, the very difficult parts of the computer chip and things like that, we'll be back here. Uh, but certain goods, uh, like for example, in chemicals, um, there's other factors to consider. Like from an EPA perspective, a lot of the chemicals actually aren't allowed to be produced in the US. Uh, so for the short term, they will still remain overseas. But in the long term, it's kind of how the administration wants to think about um, you know, jobs versus costs versus environmental risk. There's a lot of things to consider. So I hate to have a cop-out answer, but it's kind of uh, really depends on the situation. No, that's great. Thanks so much, Don. Our next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and Celia, I think this is uh, kind of in your wheelhouse. So I'll, I'll direct this towards you. Sh should or can we approach risk reactively or proactively? Um, I, and, and this question reminds me of a book that I, I saw recently that says avoiding the next pandemic. So, you know, is, are there are there ways that, you know, from a global if from from a risk standpoint that we can take to proactively, you know, or 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 should it be done react? Is it just reactively to think about risk management? Good question, Earl. And uh, I think uh, in this one, you can certainly easily answer it by saying proactively. Uh, basically, uh, what uh, insurers used to do and uh, uh, consumers and everyone pretty much was uh, operating on a reactive mode. But uh, the more they realized the importance of risk management, uh, the more they realized that uh, the risks are uh, something that um, they have to be uh, planned for, uh, the more uh, people uh, are moving into the uh, proactive mode. Now, um, having said that, there are some risks that, uh, of course, once they happen, you have to react rather than uh, proact, such as a, a cyber um, attack, for example, where you basically have done all the proactive uh, um, work that is needed, um, but uh, the attack comes. Then uh, what do you do? You have to take a very swift action. Uh, that is vital to mitigate that risk. So uh, the other thing is to have in mind is expect the unexpected, so to speak. Um, what would an unexpected uh, be? Would be like, uh, let's say a global financial market uh, um, downturn together with a global uh, cyber attack. Imagine this, I mean, everything will shut down uh, and uh, that's when you have to have uh, contingency mitigation plans uh, before anything like that happens. Uh, and most companies have this kind of plans in place, uh, but they are in different uh, uh, kind of stage of the implementation or of robustness. Uh, let's talk about a uh, perfect storm scenario, for example, a confluence of events that together basically would impair uh, the capital of uh, definitely insurers, uh, but also other companies. Well, would that, what would those be? Large catastrophe events, uh, right? Uh, pandemic is considered a, an operational catastrophe event. Um, a sharp increase in inflation at the same time. Uh, silent coverages uh, that would increase the, uh, the risk of payouts uh, for insurers. And um, increasing, uh, increased rather market volatility uh, due to corporate defaults, uh, downgrades, or equity fluctuations. So let's say you have all those four together. I mean, that's really a perfect storm. storm. Uh, it hasn't happened, but again, uh, it's not anymore the kind of black swan that, uh, you know, it's so far uh, uh, that we shouldn't be even thinking about it. Uh, so definitely the answer, the, the one word answer is proactive. And, and these are some ways. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Celia. Uh, Elmer, this question is directed to you. Um, this is from Craig Broderick, my, my good friend and mentor, former risk chief risk officer um, from Goldman Sachs, who asked, what does the panel think about the impact of government support programs on the supply of labor? 
Are they a significant contributor to the widely reported shortage of workers, particularly in lower wage sectors? So it's a loaded question. It's a um, it, it's something that you know we can we can all have various opinions on. Uh, you know, I've I've typically found myself thinking about it in, in this perspective, and that is, I don't think anyone was going to debate that there was government intervention needed in the pandemic and in, in in sort of responding to the pandemic and making sure that we have sort of a a, a soft landing or maybe. Uh, cushion to the landing and then helping us kind of come back up. It's kind of like when you watch one of those action films with the plane going down and you nearly avoid the runway and crash and burn, but you kind of take off again. Um, and you start putting the pressure on, on the joystick to bring it, bring it up. I do think that there is truth to the fact that we have uh, placed dis disincentivations into the system with the surplus of money I wouldn't say that it was wrong to do it. I would say that we should have been a little bit more. Uh, well, let me step back and, and rephrase it. I would have liked to, in my opinion, seen, seen the, the disbursement done in a different form where if, if we have the technology and we have the ability to do a lot of things in this country, particularly with big, big tech, we should be able to sort out uh, the different system, different different levels and annual incomes of, of, of households and taxpayers. And to say basically that giving somebody $600 a week who is only making $250 is probably not incentivizing them to go back to work, uh, which is where a lot of that disconnect comes from in, in terms of what Craig may be responding or seeing in, in terms of the headlines. Um, should there have been some money? I don't know what the optimal thing is because I'm not an economist. I do know that there are some states that are thinking about retrenching now before the, the, the end of September, which is trying to incentivize people to get back to work. Um, I think that the, there's, again, there, there was a need. Um, there, there's clearly in this, this day and age, in this culture, in this climate, uh, not a very short reaction to uh, things that were dismissed a long time ago, like MMT and uh, modern, for those of you who don't know, that is modern monetary theory and um, universal income that Andrew Yang, the presidential candidate had presented. You know, years ago, a lot of that was dismissed and rebuffed. Now um, we're, we're in a different point where uh, we have a lot of different risks in the system, such as government debt overhang. The speed at which uh, money is flowing is slowed down considerably that it used to be after World War II that when you gen took on, the government took on $1 debt, there's at least 3 to $4 of GDP being created. That is completely the opposite of today, whereas for every dollar is about, according to some credit analysts, it's like 29 cents. And so of GDP. So we're in a conundrum where we flooded the system. I think the approach of what could be a, uh, a balanced, uh, reduced, significantly smaller infrastructure bill is the approach we should have taken with the first sort of support programs uh, as well, in terms of being, you know, calculated in terms of what are the amounts needed. Let's strip out all the fat. Let's get to the bare bones and, and, and let's make this sort of like a milestone kind of issue like venture capital companies do and like restricted options are. If you, if you do certain things, then we go on to the next point. Great. Hey Earl, just maybe just to tag on a little bit. To sure. That, uh, first of all, I, I wholly agree with, uh, you know, Elmer's comments. I think it's a, it's a challenging question because again, there's needs that have been very stark in the past year, given what we've been through but you're balancing the larger and as yet uh, to be determined uh, long-term impacts on the economy. Uh, just for some data points, um, you know, job openings are surging. Job openings are over 8 million right now um, at pretty much an all-time high. And over 50% of these are unable to be filled. The workers are not either showing up or not there. Um, you know, the pandemic obviously uh, reduced uh, the number of uh, open jobs, 
but really in the last year, you know, between late, mid, late 2020 and now, um, over three million jobs, three and a half million jobs have become available and they can't fill them. So if you think about, you know, what that means, um, that's a huge impact. And then on top of that, um, from a negative GDP of uh, three and a half percent roughly last year, you know, we're projecting somewhere on 7% GDP growth this year, uh, swing back. That's not everyone's view. Um, but if you think about that delta of you know, roughly 10% swing, um, that means there's going to be the need for more workers. And uh, it's going to be challenging to see how kind of it all, it all pans out. But we do have some major things to consider. So, so Earl, just, just, just to go back on this, you know, because I, I want to make it clear that, you know, what, what William's saying and what I'm saying, uh, not everyone's going to agree with this. Everyone's got a different perspective. And, and that's what makes risk management in, in, in of itself kind of difficult. And Cecilia's talking about proactive. The thing is, we don't have all the known variables. You can't, you, 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 you prepare for the worst, you hope for the best. Um, but the, the, the reality is, is that what the wages were before to address uh, somebody's comments um, were, were not great. I, and I agree with that. And I think we're moving towards higher wages at a federal and a state and company level. And, and these are the things that need to move. I agree. But we also have an issue in this country where we're beyond industrialization. We're in the service and, and research and innovation. And there's been plenty of reports in the last three years that basically have said to the point of 30 million jobs over the next decade are gonna be lost. 10 million are gonna be created. That's a net deficit of 20 million on the extreme case. And so it's not about just wages. It's about innovation, it's about education, it's going back to sort of the bare bones of the foundation of the society and in, in investing. And that also addresses the diversity, equity, and inclusion question because we need to make access to, to premium education. Um, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not running for any political office here, so uh, it, it may sound like that, but, <clears throat> but the way we address it is, is having to make a, a, a having to have an understanding that we need to take some pain in the short run in order for the long run to be, to come out look, looking, feeling and looking better. Thanks, Elmer. Great question, Craig, appreciate that. Nima Edwards, uh, who is president of the International Career Advancement Association also at KPMG asked, could you please discuss how your firms are addressing ESG issues, uh, environmental social governance, what risks do you see for firms in the ESG world? Who would like to take that one? Well, I cannot talk about uh, companies per se as much as I could talk about academia that definitely, uh, you know, we are also of course taking the cues from uh, research uh, that uh, is being done regarding ESG, which is getting more and more uh, attention and emphasis. Uh, so we are in, um, you know, in close uh, cooperation with companies when it comes to uh, seeing what they're doing uh, and doing also uh, research independently. Uh, but one of the uh, important things is the, uh, you know, the climate change that we talked about earlier. Yes, uh, yes. So that's uh, the, uh, the E part, uh, first of all. Um, we uh, also talk, I mean, the inclusion and uh, uh, diversity is the uh, S part that uh, William has talked about. And uh, the G part, the governance is something that uh, risk management uh, has, you know, a whole discipline around it. So uh, between those three, I mean, all of these things uh, are being, uh, you know, addressed on the academic level, considering who uh, is going to, you know, uh, give uh, new ideas as to uh, how this uh, uh, is going to, to work out. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work being done, more courses have even uh, been added or, or sections in courses to address uh, the uh, ESG component. Uh, new positions are being um, created um, within risk management. 
So it is in the uh, uh, forefront of, uh, of companies, uh, including companies that, uh, you know, uh, do uh, asset management and uh, investing, uh, where they are interested in um, choosing those companies that are uh, more, uh, you know, active on, on the space of uh, uh, doing green investing or, you know, the, the right investing, so to speak. Great points. Thank you, Celia. William, um, here, just real quick on that. Yeah. Um, yes, it's becoming a very top priority, not only from a competitive industry sector perspective, but also uh, the markets that we serve and the clients that we serve have that as a big priority and are requiring us to shape up. So what we've done at uh, our company, uh, we have a chief responsibility officer who oversees environmental energy and sustainability, philanthropy, um, and then the governance piece uh, tied to that. And then under that umbrella also is diversity, equity, and inclusion. The mandate is that companies have become more socially responsible and you know, that's been taken very seriously. Um, some of the clients we serve, we're seeing people putting green bonds out there to actually retrofit their entire operations and uh, infrastructure. Uh, so it's becoming much more of a priority. And then obviously there's a huge rise in ESG investing and a lot of capital flowing to that sector. So I'd say it's been addressed in a variety of ways, but definitely some that's here to stay as a trend, as a, as a focus for many companies. Great point, William. And I, I would even add on to that things like racial justice investing and, and, and a variety of other um, activities that, that um, companies and organizations are being proactive in educating their employees on. It's a great point. Um, uh, next question is from an anonymous attendee. What do you see as the role of government in mitigating risk, legislation, regulation, et cetera, or other? Would like to tackle that one. I, the risk of putting my head out there on the guillotine again. Um, you know, I think it comes down to a constitutional intention, but you know, from a a risk management perspective, I, I don't think uh, it's either or. I think it's it is legislation um, and, and is regulation. Um, you see this in different ways, and whether one agrees or disagrees with current or past administration policies, um, you know they were voted in at the time. They're voted in now, and and so we expect them to at least be participants in in the. Uh, in the legislative process that will help the pop, you know, the constituents that they represent. Um, and, and legislation usually has to lead to some form of regulation and, and other, other things. You know, we have a current uh, discussion going on. I'll call it a discussion. You, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but about where the government is and its interaction with regulation of big tech. And I think that there's, there's, uh, I, I don't, I'm, it's, it's not a matter of what my opinion is, but I think that there's a fair amount out there that would say that there are obvious risks that the government is concerned about and that has been brought forth by uh, the population in different, various different parts to say that there needs to be some regulation addressed. And that that is an example real time of how the government should be playing in the role. I don't, I can't say whether it's, the optimal solution, but we're all human beings. Nothing's ever going to be uh, perfect. <clears throat> but I would say to do nothing would would be not being proactive uh, on risk management, and it would be it would be a fallacy on government's role and, and a neglection if they did not if they didn't try to come up with legislation and regulation. And there is other things that they could probably be doing, which which we <clears throat> which we know that they are. Um, and there's various different viewpoints in that, but it doesn't matter what the viewpoint is. It's, it's a question of, is there, is there activity and proactiveness on the government's part to think about the constituents that represent this country and to move forward? And, and right now, the obvious choices within that question are legislation and regulation. I think there's other, uh, other things in there as well. 
Great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I agree with what Elmer is saying, and basically what I, I could say from, uh, you know, more looking at it, the academic point of view, uh, as opposed to what's happening in companies uh, or um, how uh, they, re they respond to uh, government regulations, uh, government tends to follow. Uh, it's not, the, I mean, once the uh, uh, the risks uh, become very obvious and uh, they start seeing uh, problems or, uh, you know, um, uh, shareholders, uh, cons uh, consumers start, uh, you know, um, uh, offering their, uh, uh, their objections to, to what's happening. That's when, uh, you know, government tends to step in, uh, which means that in many cases it's rather on the reactive and uh, later side. Uh, so when it comes to the companies themselves, though, uh, they do recognize uh, regulatory and legislative risk as a major strategic risk. So they do, uh, and they should see it that way. And that's what uh, we, uh, we believe, you know, risk management should, uh, should do to consider it a, a risk that the company should uh, uh, account for ahead of time. They cannot predict the legislation, but they can be uh, again, proactive in some ways, like uh, certain um, energy companies did when it came to, uh, you know, the implementation of the uh, Paris Agreement and how uh, they were trying to to um, uh, be uh, ahead of time, even though uh, this uh, agreement had not been ratified in the U.S. Uh, so these, these are examples. This is one example where it, uh, it happened that the uh, uh, American companies were very concerned about how uh, the U.S. is going to regulate uh, emissions and carbon credits, and uh, they were trying to be um, uh, a step ahead. So uh, basically, to conclude, it's a major strategic uh, risk, uh, the regulatory uh, and regulatory and uh, legislative risk. Great. No, thank you so much. Um, we, we have another question. Um, from, from Craig Broderick, um, banks are endeavoring to manage the carbon footprints of their portfolios. This includes reducing lending to, for example, hydrocarbon producers and consumers. How should they in society more generally think about the employment and other aspects and other impacts of constraining access to capital of these industries? That's, that seems to have Elmer's name written all over it. Not to put you on the spot or anything like that, Elmer. Yeah, so I'm, I'm um, trying to process that, the, the, the question, but you know, it is true. I think that there's a, a number of banks that have scaled back on, you know, for example, reducing lending activities towards oil and gas. Um, and making probably more access to financial capital access to renewable energy pro projects. Um, if I understand the question is, is really about how should the banks and then society at, at large think about employment and other, uh, how should they think about constraining access and helping them? Uh, maybe the way to think about it to, to get more towards a you know, for climate control purposes, a carbon neutral environment. I, I think that's what I'm interpreting the question to be. And, you know, I think this is gonna be a long, a, a, a very long process. Um, I, I'm happy to see that we're making changes. And I think uh, what you see in a, a lot of things like the Exxon shareholder meeting with engine number 51 or nine, I can't remember, uh, where they placed three directors on the board, uh, you know, act, act, you know, in, in a individual investor and an institutional investor basis, we probably are going to see more and I would hope to see more uh, activist investing to, to the benefit of, of, of things like decarbonization and climate control. Um, I think the markets will be efficient to the effect of uh, where the money goes is, is sort of the, the direction of supporting more initiatives towards carbon capture, 
uh, decarbonization of uh, in, 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 in the indirect form of not supporting oil and gas in some parts of coal or all of coal and some parts of natural gas and, and more of wind, uh, maybe electrical components, supply chains, uh, all the older sort of uh, fossil fuels uh, type industries like coal mining and commodities and stuff are all wrestling with the issue, which also addresses the ESG point all wrestling around how do we mitigate the emissions into the atmosphere? How do we mitigate uh, things such as, you know, how much should we be driving electrical cars versus carbon and, you know, combustion engines and so forth. So I don't have the answer to it. I just think that uh, we're in it. We're in an upswing where society and the banks have taken, have taken one major step in terms of cutting access to the financial capital but society is doing their jobs in very different forms. And uh, I, I can't say whether uh, we've, we've, I don't know if we've scratched that surface. I, I, you know, I think Craig's question was more, how do we as a society do that and support more? I don't have a great answer to it other than, you know, we need, each of us need to be cognizant, even down to the individual basis of how do we recycle? How much electricity do we really need? Are we, you know, washing dishes uh, by putting them into efficient dishwashers, or are we just blasting the water into the sink when we rinse off things? Those, those are simple things, but, you know, in a P times Q times world of, of things that if P doesn't change, your Q needs to go up or down uh, to make a movement, right? And, and so every little thing adds up uh, at in the individual basis, there is an individual responsibility here, and and then you know corporations have to do the same. Great, <clears throat> Elmer. I know you have a hard stop at twelve fifteen. Um, I have so thank thank you so much. If the other panelists have um, maybe two more minutes, there's a there's another question that I just wanted to get to. If that's all right with the, the other panel members, but Elmer, thank you so much. It's um, you know it was a pleasure having you, and uh, have a have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Earl. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions um, that was that was specifically asked, um, and I'll, I'll leave this open, is do you or your organization treat risk management as a discrete event or a continuous process? Uh, I'll take this one. Um, for my company in particular, I'm, I'm sure a lot of other companies, risk is actually like a core strategic uh, priority. Uh, because for chemicals, it's actually um, pretty dangerous and a lot of other manufacturing things. There's a lot of equipment going on. A lot of the materials are toxic or hazardous and, you know, tough to ship and just causes health concerns if you're dealing with it improperly. Uh, so we're kind of managing on a day-to-day -day basis, really making sure everything is extremely safe, uh, and extremely environmentally friendly, especially as with all the ESG concerns have been coming up. It's actually... Um, beneficial both from a stakeholder perspective and from an economical perspective to keep risk uh, very high end uh, on our list of priorities because we can make it cheaper short term in a more dangerous way or in a more sustainable slightly more expensive way and we'll choose that second way every single time great <clears throat> thank you so much definitely um, the answer to this is continuous process uh, absolutely not discreet uh, and something that should be continuing on a uh, quarterly basis, then uh, revisited uh, every year. And uh, everything that we teach and we know uh, is, uh, you know, that it should be a process that uh, you are learning, monitoring, adjusting. So uh, that's uh, what I uh, know from, uh, you know, our academic uh, teachings, but also from what I have seen in the companies I've worked before. Wonderful. <laughs> William, did you want to add anything? Yeah, very similar to Don. Uh, it's fundamental to us. So we operate in critical and non-critical environments. And so um, actually the, the number one priority is that any, any leader or employee say is safety before service. And what we want to do is make sure that people return home with uh, their limbs and everything intact, maybe a little tired, but safely uh, going back home. Uh, so from an operational perspective, you know, the risk tied to, you know, safe operations, PPE, lockout, tagout, you know, preventive uh, maintenance, corrective maintenance, all of that is extremely important to us as an organization. 
Uh, but then also you have the financial risk, which for any Fortune 500, what you're looking at is understanding what things can, um, from a financial perspective, create any challenges for you down the road and looking far ahead enough about that so you can mitigate that. So there's financial aspect, business continuity, uh, avoiding disruptions where you can, and then just from an operational perspective, safety before service for us. That's wonderful. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank our exceptional panel, um, William, Celia, Don, thank you so much for your time. This was really insightful. I put up uh, just a, a, an article in the chat um, about an article about um, the Fulbright uh, and, and, and it was a great, a great piece in foreign affairs recently that, that really gets into issues of kind of diversity and inclusion. And I thought it would be re really uh, useful for, for members of our audience, given some of the topics that we discussed today. Thank you once again to ICAP. Thank you so much, Garvey, all of the people who helped, Tafari, Jiho, thank you all so much. Thank you, Nima, and thank you, Jamila, as well. Um, you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Earl, and thank you for having us. And thank you to all the ICAP fellows who helped put this together. You guys are doing exceptional work. Thank you. Thank you. Right.